The last storm was already on the horizon when I woke up that Sunday morning. It hung in the south, a solid black wall of dust, churning and seemingly motionless. I had every intention of sleeping late into the morning, as had been my Sunday custom since Adele and the girls had left, but the distant rumbling and crackle of lightning drug me from bed after the sunrise. I shuffled drowsily around the farm in the early morning, lashing the doors of the barn, rounding up the two stubborn hogs and shuttering the windows. But soon I found myself rooted in place, captivated by the withering shape in the sky It stretched impossibly wide across the open sky, rolling across the border of Nebraska. The air had a dry electric chill, and already the sickly yellow wheat swayed in anticipation. I was in a trance, eyes locked on the distance when I saw a small light dust plume to the west picked out in stark contrast with the black beyond. The horse and rider at the base of the little dust devil approached the farm at a sharp trot, and my dust, bleary eyes registered the silhouette. Carl Jordan had owned the farm next to mine for as long as my family has been the Dakotas. I grew up with this great booming laughter warming our home nearly every night. His usual broad yellowing smile was absent beneath the recently trimmed mustache and broad-rimmed black hat. His dark suit was blotted with a fine layer of grit that he brushed absently at. Eddie. His voice was tired and small as he looked down at me. No church today? I hadn't been in months, and he'd once admitted to envying me. I just didn't see the need any longer, and I've relished the extra hours. I ignored the question. What's troubling you, Carl? Maddie all right? I asked. He fumed towards the south, to the storm, and sucked loudly at his lower lip. After a few moments of thought, he sighed deeply with a rumble. The Hedersons are dead, all of them except Saul. He said, evenly, not returning his gaze to mine. I drank this in for a moment, feeling the insides of my sinus begin to burn in the cold and arid breeze. I definitely dwelled upon the image of the youngest Hederson, a toe-headed toddler with the dim-looking smile I'd seen in the general store with Saul and Molly a few days prior. H How? I finally asked. He grimaced slightly, still gazing south. Saul's missing. No one's seen him since last night. Molly and the kids are dead, and Saul's gone. It don't sound good. Carl slumped forward a little, and I saw, for the first time, how old he was. The whole hornet's nest is stirred up over and picking. He was going to lose the farm, they say. Fleetingly, it concerned me that I could easily see the connection between these facts. Maddie's fine, he said after a silent moment. Just a little ill this morning. Thanks for asking. He broke from the black clouds and fixed his eyes on me. He offered a pale imitation of his familiar smile, but his eyes remained squinted tight. Haunted. 
He looked as if he had more to say, but at last he just nodded and gathered the reins. Be safe, Eddie, he said, a phrase worn smooth by repeated use, and turned towards the farm, trotting quickly, his head still cocked to the side of the storm. By noon, I could only watch as it reached up and blotted out the sun. The dust storm enveloped us, obscuring the sky of the hands of God. I did my best to ration the almond of bourbon I'd poured off that morning, watching the black wind scour the earth through a broken shutter slat. During the storms of the years before, pale and weak compared to this tempest, Adele would huddle with the girls to read scripture, inevitably ending with the revelations in hushed, reverent tones. I tried not to scowl at her fear and awe before, but now I could feel a little tremor of doubt in me as I looked up at the sackcloth sky. When the sky darkened a few shades at nightfall, I prepared a small meal of bread and fried eggs and drained the rest of the bourbon. Later, I laid in the unmade bed with the world spinning and the sky howling outside and tried not to think about it. The storm raged stronger than ever the next morning, the sun winking through the maelstorm, a fat circle of hazy orange like a fading coal. Later in the day, it showed no signs of abating, and, and I resigned to leave the house, if only to feed the animals. I tied my goggles to my head and a damp bandana around my mouth, but I still gasped at the ragged burn of the dust when I stepped outside into the storm. The lining of my throat seemed to crack and bleed within moments. I could barely see the barn, but I set out instinctively towards it. A tall hellcock of fine black dust was pressed to the side, and it took me a few kicks to clear the door. The dust had seeped in everywhere, and the hogs and cows were covered in a thin layer of grime. They stood still in their pens, eyes red and glassy, shuddering and jerking with each loud creak from the roof beams. They ignored the food. There was a twisting coil of anxiety in my chest when Carl arrived, leading the terrified horse behind him. His beard matted with dust and he had to sweep the lenses of the goggles clean at my doorstep, but instead of entering, he only waved me out to join him. You need to come with me, he shouted over the storm. The dust between his teeth had formed a thin black mud and flecked at the corners of his mouth. It was his tone, flat and even, that terrified me. I didn't argue, but pulled on goggles and offered him a second bandana. I followed close behind him, one hand on the horse's haunch. Carl picked his way down the path, navigating by some uncanny memory of the curves in this little road. He walked cautiously and deliberately west, for the better part of half of a mile, past Carl's own farm, towards the leaning shape of the Collins farm. A throbbing dread began to stir in my breast as we approached. The door was thrown wide open and off one of its hinges, swinging violently in the wind. I could see Roger Collins, slumped in the doorframe, the coagulating blood on his forehead caked with the fine dirt. His eyes were open. The left eye beneath the bullet hole was flooded red and tilted wildly skyward. Clutched, in his curled hands was a rifle with one spent casing. 
Abigail Collins and her youngest were inside, curled tightly around each other in the corner of the room. The flowers of blood that bloomed on the fabric of their dresses was bright and vivid. Slumped upright at the dinner table, as if ready for a meal, was another figure, filthy and caked in black dust. He seemed composed, sitting upright, proud, despite the pinprick bullet hole, clean and bloodless, standing starkly in the center of his throat. His grimy skin was dried and shriveled. His eyes were closed, the lids sunken over the pits. It took a long, yawning moment to recognize the distated face. Saul Hatterson. Hands clasped around a little revolver, looking for all the world, like he'd been dead for a week. Saul Hatterson, grinning obscenely wide, showing dried black gums. Despite the roaring storm, there was an unearthly stillness in this little house, and I can hear my heart thudding in my ears. I tombed to Carl with a pitiful expression, a plea for some sort of understanding. I was bringing them canned food. Roger was worried about being able to last out a long storm. He shouted from the front porch, where he was closing Roger's eyes and wiping blood from his hands. He looked up at me and stood. Jed's missing. I gazed around the room again, before turning to Carl. You don't think that Jed... I began, letting the idea remain unsaid. Jed was a quiet and sickly kid, but something about him always set my teeth on edge. No, he barked. I don't think a 15-year-old could be capable of this, but I didn't think Saul was either. None of this makes any sense. He brushed the lenses of his goggles clean once more. No, it doesn't. I agreed. We should head into Picton to tell someone, but I... I need you to drive the Collins forward. I can make it between our three farms on foot, but I don't think that me or that horse could make it all the way into town. Carl looked mildly embarrassed. Hidden as he was behind dust and beard. And I followed him to the barn. The Model A made a few grinding rasps before dying completely, refusing to respond to anything. When I opened the gas cap, a damp and clumping mixture of dust and gasoline had tumbled from the little opening. My breath came in increasingly slow gasps as we moved to the Collins tractor, unscrewing the cap. The same reeking clay was stuffed at the top of the tank. The walk back towards our farms was silent, my heart pounding as I struggled to keep my breathing steady, as the inside of my sinuses were scorched raw. First, Carl's tractor. Then we checked mine, both useless and clogged with this dust. If Carl was panicking as I was, he refused to show it. Eddie, I don't know what this means. He yelled to me as we crouched over my tractor, the sky dimming. But I think I'd appreciate it if you stayed with me and Maddie tonight. The storm should let up in the morning, I'm sure. I can see the last spark of fear in his eyes and it brought me a little solace. Carl went ahead, panicky with thoughts of Maddie, stuck in bed and on her own, and I agreed to follow shortly. I entered my house to gather my shotgun and a tin of coffee. I don't believe I intended to start drinking, but the bloody and crooked eye was shining wetly in my memory and 
I drew from the bourbon a few soothing pulls. I recall being tired and wary from the day's grim business, but I don't remember lying down on the cold wood floor. When I woke, gripping the gun and empty bottle, the sky was lighter, but the whirling black cloud still surrounded the world on all sides. Tuesday, I thought through a fog of pain, or, or was it Wednesday? I groggily allowed the shame to flood in when I realized I'd left Carl and Maddie waiting all night. After finding all the water drained the night before, I dressed for the storm and headed out to the well. The pump handle strained against me as I pressed downward, building up the first sounds of water. What came out of the pump was black and viscous, a thin black paste. I dropped the tin bucket in disgust, feeling yesterday's dread igniting behind this alcohol ache, and I quickly turned towards Carl's farm. On the road, with my destination not yet visible, I turned to see behind me. There wasn't even a faint outline of my barn. In that moment, I was alone, surrounded by a wall of vibrating earth and wind on all sides. It could have been all of creation, and I would never know. It could be the end of creation, and I would never know. I turned back towards Carl's farm and began to run in panic, frantically, hoping I had not altered direction. As the small, unpainted house came into view, I saw Carl's horse, lying motionless on the ground, still tied to the railing on the porch. A small dune of black dust had formed against one side. The door, wide open, slamming into the wall with a sharp crack at each breath of the storm. My panic spiked like fever when I stepped inside and my body began shaking violently. Maddie lay, spilled from her bed, trailing sheets and, and, and shredded fragments of her nightgown. Her head was twisted and neck bruised and bent. The bulging glassy eyes seemed to stare directly at me. Her tongue was thick and black between her teeth. Seated on the bed above her, spiny legs dangling over the edge, was the dried and leathery corpse of Jed Collins, the missing boy. His eye sockets gaped empty and black as he silently grinned out at the world. Carl was nowhere to be found. I backed out quietly from the house, at least truly toning out the chaotic roar of the storm. My mind spun trying to make sense of this utter madness, and it stoked the fires inside me, panting, desperate dread flooding my limbs until I found myself propelled blind, running through the storm toward my home, I continued past a hulking silhouette of my barn, legs flooding with fire as I sucked in great lungfuls of this choking dust. I thought nothing of destination. I only wanted to get as far away from the storm as I possibly could, far from the empty, charred houses of my neighbors. And the empty eyes and, and wicked grins. I made it as far as the edge of my land. I saw the walls of shifting haze, the black outline of the river from a distance. When I approached, legs slow and lungs burning, I saw the river more clearly, wide and unearthly still. The water, black and thick. And in mute disbelief, I watched it flow, slowly like molasses, under a dark and churning sky. And then I began to understand. I nailed the shutters closed, driven by an animal urgency of purpose. The door I braced with Adele's heirloom cabinet, allowing it to crack the splinter on the side as I stacked a steamer chest on top. 
I didn't really believe that this would slow whatever would come for me tonight in the howling darkness, but I wanted to have the time to know, to be sure. The last bourbon bottle lay empty on the floor, and I was glad for this, for the chance to be clear-headed at least. I sat back against the wall, facing the door with the shotgun in my hands, and I waited. The sky darkened and the storm continued to howl. I measured my breaths, trying to hold on to that moment of calm, to stretch it out until it dried and snapped apart. It was late at night when it arrived. I can hear heavy footsteps circling the porch, pulling lightly, testing each shutter. My hands were suddenly slick with sweat on the barrel of the shotgun. The shuffling footsteps in the front door, and I saw the wood flex ever so slightly as pressure was applied. The scraping sound began to rise, hissing from the small barricade as it began to slowly slide across the floor. The force on the other side of the door increasingly, slowly, steadily, grinding against a heavy barricade until the door was open to the storm and the night beyond. The figure stepped into the room with a silent glance that surprised me and stood regarding me. Carl's skin seemed to crackle and go taut like paper as he moved and in the hollow of his eyes were tiny twisting clouds of dust, blue ribbon of electricity arching across the sockets. He was smiling, a, a smile I'd, I'd never seen from him, a wide, obscene grin. I felt a strange sort of calm then. The surety of knowing, despite the impossible madness of it all, I raised the shotgun. Eddie, the thing inside Carl hissed, in a voice like grinding sand. The corpse took another step towards me and I saw a black trickle of mud from the edges of its cracked lips. Go ahead and shoot, Eddie. See what it gets you. I smiled back at him, seeing the solution so clearly at last. I took a moment to be thankful for Adele and the girls that they were gone, thankful in an awful way that I'd struck her hard enough for her finally to leave me. This would not be the night that they die. It had moved halfway across the room now, shuffling towards me. The malevolent sparks of its eyes locked onto me. That now familiar dread reared up to swallow my temporary peace. I saw in the black whirlpool of its eyes the great storm, covering the entire earth in a final gloom. I saw trails and chains of endless murder and atrocity crisscrossing the darkened world into that last eternal night. I saw the end. All I had left was a little sliver of hope, enough to spur me onward. I swung the shotgun under my chin, feeling the cool of the barrel on my chin. The thing inside Carl jerked to a halt and ceased to smile, and I knew I'd gamble right this time. It needed me, and it can't have me. I made sure I was smiling, drinking in this thing's rage and frustration. The thing roared and, with a leap, burst from Carl's body, his dying muscles snapping and shredding into long fraying fibers as it Shred him like a, a coat, thudding to the floor behind. It was a swirling cloud, a flurry of dust, coursing with lightning and pure elemental hatred that I saw then, surging towards me faster than I'd ever believed possible. Thin tendrils coiled and tightened and wound their way through the air, twisting toward my mouth and nose, I could feel them caress the raw passages of my lungs, hot, twisting, and unmistakably horrid. 
alive as they slid into me. I pulled the trigger. I hope you ghouls enjoyed this semi-long uh, Nebraska creepypasta. I think it's a Nebraska creepypasta. I don't know. Either way, it's really interesting and I really like it. It, I don't know, it started out like slow and then it got really good to like where it was, I guess, paranormal or mystic or whatever versus just like a crazy earth type storm. Let me know how you liked it in the comments below. But as always, ghouls, the last video will be on the top left. The next video will be on the bottom left. All my social medias are on the screen as well as in the description box below. And remember, there's always someone or something watching you.